In the introduction to bonding theories, we saw that a bonding theory has to carve up the molecular electron density in a useful or insightful way. In this video, we're going to develop the foundations of valence bond theory and see how valence bond theory does this by thinking about bonding electrons as arising from the overlap of adjacent atomic orbitals. This is the essence of valence bond theory. So it's a fundamentally localized theory, which is really nice. It's sort of one step beyond the Lewis structural model. We can use a lot of our intuitive ideas about where electrons are located in Lewis structures to infer ideas in valence bond theory. And I wanted to start again with this picture of DDQ to remind us that what we're going to do here is really conceptualize the molecular electron density. For example, making the claim that we can look at the CN triple bond right here as involving electrons that are localized to carbon and nitrogen or between just those two atoms. We don't need to worry about electrons wandering over the molecule as a whole. That's not entirely true in the DDQ molecule, so valence bond theory isn't the best description here actually, but it's an approximation we can make, and it works great in particular for what we'll call sigma bonds, which we'll introduce toward the end of this section. All right, so let's get into valence bond theory. There are two big ideas that we're going to introduce here when it comes to valence bond theory as really the key to this theory of bonding, and the first is orbital overlap. Orbital overlap will also be important for molecular orbital theory, and so it's a, a very important idea in general that we can think of bonds as arising from the overlap of atomic orbitals, either between a pair of adjacent atoms or even over three or more atoms when we start getting into delocalized orbitals in molecular orbital theory. The second idea, which is really key to valence bond theory and unique to this theory, is hybridization the notion that we can think about combining atomic orbitals on a single atom to generate a new set of atomic orbitals consistent primarily with the geometries of electrons about an atom that we've already seen in the context of Vesper theory. The basic atomic orbitals, S, P, D, etc., can't account for these geometries, and we'll see why later and how hybridization solves that problem. All right, so one of the key ideas to valence bond theory and indeed to molecular orbital theory as well, is this notion that a bond arises through the overlap of atomic orbitals. When atomic orbitals overlap, we get interaction between the electrons occupying those orbitals, and this gives rise to the covalent bond. In valence bond theory, we tend to think only about the overlap of orbitals on adjacent atoms. So for example, here in this figure, you see an ethane molecule, C2H6, and there's a large region of overlap between these orbitals on the adjacent carbon atoms, roughly speaking, it's right here. This overlap gives rise to the bond, and we think of each orbital as bringing in a single electron, for example, one electron here and one ele electron here, and this gives rise to the two electron covalent bond between the two carbon centers. Now, these two orbitals may not look familiar to you. They're they look kind of like skewed p orbitals. They don't look exactly like p orbitals, and they certainly don't look like spherically symmetric s atomic orbitals. In fact, they're hybrids, and we'll come to hybridization a little bit later. But for the time being, the key idea for valence bond theory is that bonds arise from the overlap of adjacent atomic orbitals, atomic orbitals located on linked atoms that are relatively close to one another. There's a distance dependence to bond energy, and it has to do with the fact that orbital overlap depends on the distance between the two atoms involved in the bond. So say, for example, we started with two atoms of hydrogen at a relatively large distance so that they're far enough away that they hardly know the other one is there, sufficiently far apart to have no interaction. As the atoms move close to each other, their orbitals start to interpenetrate. We start to get overlap between the 1s orbitals on each of those hydrogen atoms. This causes a stabilizing effect as well because the negatively charged electrons, for example, here and here, are coming closer to the positively charged nucleus of the other hydrogen atoms. So there's electrostatic attraction going on there along with the orbital overlap. We reach a point where that's sort of the ideal distance between the nuclei for that attraction to, of the electrons to both nuclei. And 
Beyond that point, if we try to push the atoms closer together, we run into problems with electron-electron repulsion because, of course, beyond this point, we've got these negatively charged electron clouds very strongly interpenetrating, and that's going to cause repulsive forces to build in and the energy of the system to go up. So there's a point where we reach an energy minimum, and at this equilibrium point, we're at the so-called bond length or bond distance here at 74 picometers, and we're at the bond energy. And for hydrogen molecules, H2 molecules, that's about 7.24 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And this is a negative value with respect to the zero, which is the H atoms infinitely far apart or far, far enough apart that their interaction is negligible. This picture of the bond energy going down to a minimum and then back up is a very common and important one for covalent bonding. And the shape of this potential is known as the Leonard-Jones potential. This is a term that you may see in various resources online. And to learn more, this is absolutely a term that you can search for to learn more about this potential. But it's a good picture to keep in mind that there's an equilibrium bonding distance. And on either side of that bonding distance, the energy of the system goes up, either because we're diminishing attractive forces as we move the electrons farther away from the other nucleus or increasing repulsive forces as we try to force those electron clouds too close together. This slide shows some typical energies and lengths of covalent bonds. I don't want to spend too much time on the numbers, but I'll just point out some general trends here. Notice that a typical covalent bond is on the order of 100 picometers or 0.1 nanometers in length, and typical bond energies are between 100 and 1,000 kilojoules per mole. We can also notice here a trend in bond length and bond strength or bond energy as a function of the number of linkages between the atoms. So for example, a carbon-carbon single bond is weaker than a carbon-carbon double bond. We see the bond energy a little bit less than doubles, and a double bond is weaker than a triple bond. And, and here again, we're not multiplying the single bond energy by three for reasons that will become clear after we talk about sigma and, and pi bonding. The next slide just shows some more examples of bond energies and again drives home these ideas that a typical bond length is on the order of 100 picometers and a typical bond energy is somewhere between 100 and 1,000 kilojoules per mole. 